Okay, fellow AP language teachers. So by special request, I was asked to uh, demonstrate how each of the FRQs, so one, two, and three on the 2021 exam can be executed um, by incorporating my templates. So that's what I've done. So we're uh, finally here at FRQ three. Uh, and here's the prompt and everything's going to stay status quo for this. I'm going to operate from the assumption that uh, you have some familiarity with my work. Uh, otherwise, if you're, uh, you know, brand new to this and uh, don't have full indoctrination into the uh, the art of my templates, you might want to backtrack and take a look at some of my other earlier YouTube videos. Uh, so for this. I'm going to make it relatively quick because it's super easy. So we're going to take a look at how to construct the introductory paragraphs, uh, either with the declarative or the inverted thesis. And then we'll tackle the body paragraph syllogistically. And uh, as always, I'll Bob Ross my examples for you so that uh, you have a clear understanding of what that looks like on paper so that um, you know it makes sense for your kids. So here's the prompt from 2021. Many people spend long hours trying to achieve perfection in their personal or professional lives. Similarly, people often demand perfection from others, creating expectations that may be challenging to live up to. In contrast, some people think perfection is not attainable or desirable. Write an essay that argues your position on the value of striving for perfection. So in breaking this down for my students, I mean, basically it's, it's this simple. So your thesis statement must be anchored in some ideological concept with regards to perfection, right? So if you're talking about anything else, uh, you're probably missing the mark as far as uh, articulating a clear defensible thesis with regards to the demands of the assignment. So you got to talk about perfection, right? That's the exclusive focus here. So as always, when I'm working with teachers, I tell them that you got to Bob Ross your instruction. So here's what I mean by that. You're the expert writer in the classroom. So show your kids how to do this. Don't, don't just assign it, show them. So provide plenty of models and exemplars. And I always give this example. So imagine if Bob Ross comes onto the screen and he says something, you know, akin to, hello, happy little people. Today, we're going to paint a beautiful New England autumnal landscape with beautiful fall foliage. And in the center of our canvas, we're going to include a New England uh, wood covered bridge. And then he walks away from the canvas. He walks away from the easel and he just talks about it or he gives us a graphic organizer. It's all in the ether, right? We're not going to improve as painters. We're, we're not gonna really know, have a clear understanding of how to execute that unless we have a natural knack for painting. And the same goes for our writing students. So we need to get to the canvas and the easel and paint with them. And the cool thing about Bob Ross is that he always used one template. One, they call it a heuristic. And it's called the wet on wet technique. So literally every single time the guy painted, he used the wet on wet technique. And uh, me with my students, no matter the expository mode, whether it's argument like this or synthesis, Persu you know, persuasion, rhetorical analysis, literary analysis is always the same template. We're going to declare, invert, go, syllogistic. And uh, I just show my guys lots of models and example exemplars and it demystifies the process for them. So don't be afraid to write with your kids. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this, how do I write the introductory paragraph? And it's the same old, same old. So we can declare or invert. So for those that are familiar with my work, you know that for rhetorical analysis, I espouse a declarative route for that. And for literary analysis, I uh, tend to have my students invert. For argument, persuasion, and synthesis, and you throw in research into that as well, it's just an extension. Uh, it's a 50-50 coin flip, so you can either declare or invert the thesis. So each introductory paragraph that my students write uh, when they're manipulating the template is going to be exactly four sentences long, no more, no less, exactly four sentences. 
The easiest thing to do for a struggling or emerging writer is just to begin with the thesis, and that would be the declarative. Just boom, out of the gate, drop it like it's hot. So declare the thesis. You would have to say something with regards to perfection, right? You have to make some argumentative statement with regards to the state, the quality, the nature of perfection. So you could do that right out of the gate. All right. The other things that I look for with regards to the introductory paragraph is I like a good academic uh, tone. You know, nothing pedantic, not uh, pretentious, not uh, out of the wheelhouse, but a good academic tone. So I tell my students that, you know, I want them to sound like, you know, read, write, think and speak like college sophomore English majors come time of the exam. You know, so you got to cop a certain diction uh, in your writing. So my students um, have gone through my word study academy with me all year long. So you're going to note that their vocabs are pretty decent. And I just call that tier two level vocabulary, your average run of the run of the mill SAT level word. Uh, my students also know how to manipulate their syntax pretty well. Um, I do an extensive nuance academy and I stole a page from Strunk and White, their textbook called Write It Right. They make the assertion that there's 12 different ways to construct a single sentence and I skill and drill my kids on that so that they have good voice rhythm and flow and um, you know just basically know how to wield their syntax. Um, for effect. So uh, you'll see some good variation with their sentence constructs. And as I already said, it's going to be four sentences long. So that's the declarative. The flip of that is the inverted. And in this case, and I think uh, you, you see a lot of students try to do this, they might begin with an analogy, context, background, the old hook method, uh, and then they end with the thesis. The fourth sentence is going to be the thesis and the rest stays the same. You see the tier two, the sentence constructs and um, um, you know, just a matter of uh, thesis first or thesis last. So for this particular prompt, um, this is how my students tackled it, right? You have to, have to, have to stay anchored in the prompt. So you know, I told my guys, if, if you write your introduction and neglect to mention the word perfect and have some articulated definition of that, then you probably ain't got a thesis. So this is example number one. Some people get stymied by their fear of being less than perfect. And unfortunately, this can damn a person to being more than imperfect, right? So, and I know a lot of students that uh, fit that attribute. Striving for perfection is futile. What one must do to achieve perfect ideals is to strive for continuous improvement. Always making forward strides in life is a lofty expectation, but one can never do so perfectly. It's 100% pure thesis, right? A little context, background. You know, the sentence constructs in this are not, uh, you know, blowing my mind. Um, but it's, it goes above and beyond that short, simple sentence, short, simple sentence, that dot, 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 dot rhythm that we often hear from our struggling and emerging writers. So there's a decent flow and it's got this nice philosophical quality to it because they're arguing, you know, sound like a little Aristotle, sound like a little Socrates. So the vocab's nice. I like the word stymied is really, uh, is really, is really a good, good use there. Uh, strides, lofty. So don't overdo it. Stay in the wheelhouse, right? But nothing extraneous comes in this. There's no uh, mention of the textual support. Um, so that doesn't come into the picture. There's no need to regurgitate the prompt. So just a straight up nuts and bolts thesis. So, and again, just state the thesis first sentence or fourth sentence. Here's one more. With most endeavors, perfection cannot be attained. So again, get anchored in the prompt. But there's such a thing as the perfect chase for perfection. Given that perfection is an ideal detached ideal detach from reality, what matters most is trying to achieve a perfect state of excellence. One cannot be perfectly perfect, but one can be perfectly excellent. So again, you don't even need to front load anything. Don't bring in anything extraneous. Um, you don't need to show your whole, your, your whole hand in the introduction. It's just a thesis. Right. And I'll show you in the syllogistic body paragraph 
um, you know, you're going to you're going to hold off on your textual support uh, until you get into the, the territory of the body paragraphs themselves. So that's it. Nuts and bolts thesis statement. So four sentences, tier two sentence constructs. State it first or state it last. Here's another one following the exact same template. And sometimes students, um, when they invert, will make an outside reference. And, um, you know, I think some teachers call it the hook or the analogy method. And uh, that works well, um, you know, but sometimes, especially in time, time test taking situations, you know, the muse isn't there for the kid. You know, the, the, po the poetry just ain't making it that day. So to have a clever connection, a clever hook, um, often eludes kids and they just need to cut to the chase and get into and out of the essay quickly. But this student um, made a connection to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the idea, the concept of uh, progress rather than perfection, which is kind of a mantra of AA. So that's how they begin. Members of Alcoholics Anonymous live by a simple motto. Sober living is a matter of progress, not perfection. Right, so we haven't articulated the thesis yet. So this definitely is going to invert. We have to clearly articulate it here. Sober or not, this philosophy is very grounding, especially given that perfection is unattainable. What one should seek is success instead. One of the noblest things man can do is perfectly chase the ideals of working toward great success in life, even if that entails running into a few failed attempts along the way. So that does it for the introduction for FRQ3. My students do that systematically, and it's really no different than how they would tackle um, an introduction for literary analysis. You're just omitting the literary terms. You're not, you're not, you don't have a text. You know, same for rhetorical analysis. It's straight up nuts and bolts thesis, right? Every single time they... Uh, they can do that. You know, I talk to my students a lot about the sophistication of ideas. You know, um, I find when I read FRQ3s, I, I, you know, joke with my students and tell them to avoid the, um, I, I call it teeny bopperism. You know, like sometimes in FRQ3s when I read them, it's like I'm reading emojis. They sound very young. They sound very immature with their textual support and their ideas. And I always tell them like, college sophomore English majors at all times when you write. So choose your textual support wisely, you know, kind of wax philosophical if the, uh, if the prompt lends itself and be your mature, most academic self. So how do we then get out of the introductory paragraph into the body paragraphs? And it's simple, same old, same old. You're going to proceed syllogistically. And I'm really hoping that those of you that are familiar with my work, you're saying to yourselves, holy cow, this guy's a broken record. He says the same thing. And that's the glory of the template. It doesn't change. It totally demystifies the writing process for kids once they... Um, develop a, 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 you know, a knack and an alacrity for how, how to manipulate it through the expository modes. So um, just a quick synopsis of the syllogistic method. Uh, I do deeper dives into the history and the rationale behind this in other YouTube videos, but for the sake of um, getting us through this essay, uh, I'll give you the quick rundown. So the syllogistic method is rooted in Aristotelian uh, it's, it's Aristotelian in nature from Aristotle. He ran a school called the Lyceum, and the rich aristocratic boys would go there to learn about polemics, debate, oration. And oftentimes, you know, they'd huddle up in a circle. And, you know, we see this in classic texts like Plato's Republic, by which the topic of what is justice is thrown out. And all these philosophical think takers come to the mic and they drop their definition of what justice is. And then they huddle up and they find the, the, the holes in the logic and propose a different definition until you have an accord on what justice is. And Aristotle, like us, English teachers, writing instructors, noticed that some students were really struggled to sustain a clear, cogent line of reasoning. So he developed a heuristic for them. We call it a template. And uh, he coined it the syllogistic method. 
And he said logic is basically mathematic. It's computative. It's organized. It's logical. So if we can go uh, premise, premise, conclusion, and keep all the parts uh, you know, connected, we can sustain a clear line of reasoning. So if I were to say in the first premise, arsenic is deadly, and follow it by a second premise of my dog ate arsenic, and then conclude by saying my dog is going to die, I don't think anyone would argue and say, oh my God, that's logically flawed. That's ridiculous. That's so flawed, Christian. You know, you're an idiot. What are you saying, right? So this is how we want our students to argue. Um, very mathematic, very computative, very tight, cogent reasoning. In FRQ3, this is what the syllogistic method is going to look like. The first premise is going to be an argument that states a why reason. The thesis basically just defines, takes a stance, right? So in the premise, you got to get into your whys. Why, why are you arguing this point about perfection, right? What's your reason? So the first premise, as I'll model in just a second, always, no matter the expository mode, is going to be three sentences long. So on the synthesis uh, essay, FRQ1, on the Lang exam, the College Board always says that your argument must be central. And I wish they had that rule for everything, you know? I, I, even with like my Regents Gen Ed kids, you know, I tell them, your argument has to be central. It's expository writing, we're arguing. So I wanna hear your argument. So don't get into summative stuff. You know, don't regurgitate anything for me. Argue, argue, argue. So I want three sentences to get really anchored in the central point of the argument. The second premise in FRQ3 is tricky because it's the textual support. Typically, students have a text, like they're synthesizing or they have a, you know, a rhetorical passage or a literary passage and they quote and they paraphrase. This is tricky in that they're writing in absence of text. So the textual support is coming from their heads, from their noodles, right? So they need to articulate something with regards to the quality of perfection and in regards to how they defined it. So, I, and again, I tell my students, don't sound like teeny boppers. Get something profound, right? You know, be, be thoughtful. Think about what the rest of the kids in the nation are going to write about. And, uh, you know, stand out, stand aside. So the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph, and I really want to clarify that, not the conclusion paragraph of the essay, but the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph is uh, the link and the promise. I always tell my students that the first premise is a promise. So I promise to logically argue through something. You know, at the end, you shake hands back to it and you got to echo the thesis. So in the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph, one word needs to be mentioned, and that's perfection. So, um, and I'll model that for you in just a second. So the kid has to say something about perfection in order to link it all back to the first premise and the thesis and meet the demands of the assignment. So students often make good observations and they say, Kuhn, we're using templates. The introduction is four sentences long, no more, no less. You must have a magic number of sentences for a syllogistic body paragraph. And I do, I tell them to shoot for 10. Uh, 10 sentences, hard cap at 12. Don't exceed 12, otherwise you're probably gonna break your line of reasoning, go for a bird walk, bloviate, um, get plot heavy, and it's not gonna serve you well. So those little itty bitty four, five, six sentence body paragraphs that we often get just don't have enough in them. There's not enough pith in them to um, fully substantiate and defend an argument. So I say shoot for 10. All right. So let's take a look at a full body paragraph here. So first three sentences set up the argument, all right? And again, we have to stay rooted in the thesis and meet the demands of the assignment. We're talking about perfection, right? So we have to make some argument about perfection while introducing the concept of our textual support. So look how this goes. Some of the world's most ingenious inventions that propelled humanity forward were wrought in thousands of failed attempts. If these great thinkers were to have been bogged down by the strivings of perfection, we would be without things like the automobile, telephone, 
even seemingly simple things such as the fork and spoon. But the thing is, there is such a thing as perfecting the fine art of failing. All right, so when I conference with my students and when I grade, I often say, put those first three sentences into a promise, like in, like in I promise you, dear reader, to talk about X, Y, and Z. What are you gonna talk about? What are you promising? So I'm going to make the assumption that the student is going to talk about an inventor and how this inventor perfected the fine art of failing, that this inventor failed and failed and failed and failed, and then bingo, the eureka moment of a fantastic invention happened. And that's what we got if um, uh, we're going to have a sustained line of reasoning. So fourth sentence begins the second premise. And I tell my students immediately get into the source. And this student is going the route of Thomas Edison. So look at the transition. An excellent example of this is Thomas Edison. He was one of the most successful inventors in American history, commonly referred to as the Wizard of Menlo Park, a larger-than-life figure who seemed to be able to construct miraculous things from the cosmos of his mind. But the man also stumbled, sometimes tremendously. In response to a question about his missteps, Edison once said, I've not failed 10,000 times. I've successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. And just to clarify, you know, these, stu these students did not, um, you know, have access to the internet or anything to do any research. That quote is coming directly from the kid's head. They memorized that quote, okay? So um, kids, you know, it's, just, it's all coming from the head. From a historical perspective, most people are not aware of Edison's botched inventions. He would sometimes spend years turning the gears of one of his brain children, but to no avail in the end. So let's, before we go on to the next slide to see how the rest of this fleshes out, let's just, let's just talk about a couple of things. The line of reasoning is completely intact in the sense that all the textual support needs to resonate with the concept of perfection, right? Because that's the thesis. So we're talking about Edison in relation to the concept and the thesis argument of perfection. If anything extraneous comes in or we get waylaid and get off task by, by something else, then we've broken our line of reasoning. So, so far, everything's good. Now, um, I haven't spent a lot of time in this writing workshop talking about these things, but um, same concepts that, uh, that, I, that I'm always uh, addressing in my writing workshops. I love it when my students can balance, like teeter-totter balance, the colloquial, the vernacular, and the academic. So this kid clearly has a good vocab, right? But when they can do things like uh, turn the gears of one of his brain children. I call that the hipster point. That's the type of kid that walked into the coffee house and like invented the very first latte. You know, that's, that's how, I, how I articulate that to my kids. I'm like, be spunky, be you, have personality, right? Don't be dry and pedantic, but don't be overly simplified either. So to get that pizzazz, the spunk, the flair point, um, I like to see my students do that. So let's keep going here. Perfection is a matter of perspective. Edison did not hang his head and give up. He instead looked at the snags of his efforts and said, let's keep trying. By the end of his life, he had 1,093 inventions, including the phonograph, the motion picture camera, and the light bulb. In essence, his efforts gave birth to 1,093 inventions that spawned from endless failures. Again, keep it anchored in the thesis, keep it anchored in the prompt. So that textual support, the second premise, cannot be disassociated from the first premise or the thesis, right? Line of reasoning, all connected. So now here, at this stage of the syllogistic body paragraph, we got to wrap it up. And I told my students, you know, um, as, we, as we do the FRQ3s, you have to say in the conclusion, every conclusion of a syllogistic body paragraph, the buzz word or buzz words of the prompt. So I told, you know, these guys, you got to say perfection. Link it all back to perfection. And that way, hopefully, you've uh, put a bow on your argument. So let's see what this kid does here. Had Edison been of the mindset whereby he sought the perfect ideals of perfection, 
His name would have been forgotten many years ago, but instead his legacy lives on because he recognized that failure can be a perfect impetus for creation and success. Traits like tenacity that allow one to never give up are perfect. You hear it? You got you got you got that's got to resonate. It's got to echo throughout the whole paper. But striving for perfection in all endeavors is a futile pursuit. So echo that thesis. Throw it right back to it. And that was 11 sentences, right? So full-bodied, cogent, strictly adhered to line of reasoning from start to finish. And it's just the principal stuff that, you know, I talk about with students and I train my students and teachers. You know, the, the, the vocab's nice, good balance of voice. Uh, the sentence constructs have good voice rhythm flow. It's all there. You know, it's a pretty, pretty polished piece. So all of that can be taught. It's just practice, practice, practice. Hammer the template. Bob Ross, your instruction with your kids. So that puts a wrap on FRQ um, perfection, you know, number three from 2021. So any hoot and holler, I um, have a couple of irons in the fire that uh, I'll draw your attention to. I am doing some webinars monthly with Perfection Learning that um, you can attend. It's going to be the last Tuesday of every month, so just follow along in the Facebook groups. And um, I know some of you are on my mailing list, and uh, so um, I'm slated uh, to do one a month. Uh, I got an iron in the fire with uh, the National Writing Project. We'll be doing some work together. And I don't know if you guys heard, but Tim Freitas, Brandon Abden, and I are going to be presenting at the National Council's Teachers of English Annual Conference in Anaheim in the fall. And Tim and I are writing a book together. So staying very busy, staying very active. And one of the things that um, I will be doing uh, in the coming weeks, if you're interested, if you see my my teaching style, my methods, my madness, and you're like, I like what this guy is doing. We can work together if you would like. So um, I'm working with, um, I'm gonna cap it probably about five teachers, uh, a course that I've devised called Teach It Right Five Week Mastermind, where um, currently we're gonna be meeting um, Thursday nights, five consecutive Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for one hour a pop, and uh, basically, I'm just going to coach teachers my, um, my ways, my templates, my alternative grading methods, my Plato's Plato discussion, and um, kind of take that anecdotal information uh, as, you know, teachers revamp, retool, recalibrate their instructional approaches to composition and uh, use that anecdotal information in my textbook that I'm writing with Tim. So if you want more information on that, you can um, reach out, uh, teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. I also have a web page, uh, teachinghowtowrite.com. You can get information there. But we'd love to work with you if you're uh, interested and uh, eager to uh, try your hand at uh, a different paradigm of doing things. So. Hopefully you found this to be useful and uh, can use it in your test prep material. So for now, happy teaching, happy writing.